All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXGS Weekly episode 18. As you might see, we've went through quite a way. I mean, there's there's a lot of episodes, to be honest. And uh, yeah, it's summertime, so there's not too many interesting things happening. Although you know, I managed to find some cool things for you. We mostly have articles and news today. Um, we got some releases and a bunch of libraries and demos and uh, even a bit of a silly stuff so you know not everything is totally lost this time around but uh, since it's summer most of this stuff is well i mean let's say it's not extremely original let's put it this way still some good things um so you know let's just get started as usual you can find all the mentioned links in the github repository there should be a link in the description for the Twitch, if you're watching this on Twitch channel, uh, in, in the video description on YouTube or on Dev2, if you're watching it there. And uh, yeah, as always, you know, if you find any more cool things, you are welcome, more than welcome to send it my way uh, for me to cover it next time around. But uh, let's get started, I guess, right? The first article we have today is called Fractal Node.js App Structure. Um, this is essentially a case study, a uh, with case study is that the correct or study case no case study right uh, so it's a basically outline of the way to structure the app uh, for this specific author the way that he does it and uh, this sort of pretty complex app actually and uh, the author goes through all of the structure explaining how the server works how the routes are made and all that kind of stuff so if you are curious about the structures of Medium size, I guessed, uh, Node.js app, so I wouldn't call that extremely large, and sort of existing approaches, then do have a look at this article. It does give you a pretty interesting um, outlook on that. All right, continuing, we got broken link hijacking, how expired links can be exploited. If you didn't know, the broken link hijacking is actually a thing, and uh, this is something you should be wary of, especially if you are using CDNs and uh, you know getting the scripts from there, be it libraries or um, whatever you might load from there, like CSS, JavaScript, all of that can be hijacked. And this article goes into the explanation what it actually is, uh, how it might be hijacked, and what kind of harm can you uh, expect if it happens to your website, right? And also how to actually prevent it by using a bunch of tools, including bron broken link checker and things like this. So do have a look at this. It is quite interesting. And I think, uh, you know, if you didn't know about it, there's definitely something to care about, especially if you are using third party um, content delivery networks. All right, next article we have is a connection aware components. So this is a really interesting uh, approach, I think. So the article itself is also quite well written and uh, easy to understand. Uh, it talks about the components that are not just display some sort of content, but they are actually aware of the current connection, depending, you know, you might have 4G, 3G, 2G, slow 2G, and depending on the country you're living in, your mobile connection can differ wildly, right? So, and the idea is that your uh, UI components actually should reflect the speed of the network. So the API is unfortunately not quite there yet, as you can see, it's still experimental and it works mostly just in Chrome basically. But uh, it's, I guess it's in uh, what WG spec probably, at least that's what I'm guessing in. And uh, let's have a quick look here. Okay, so this is a design. No, it's actually W3C. Okay, that's that's cool. That's really cool. So it's gonna be a W3C spec and is on a way and it's gonna be supported by all platforms uh, eventually. So yeah, the idea is to use that API and make your component aware of the uh, current network state, right? So here's a simple example. If you are offline, you just show some sort of a placeholder. If you're on a bad network, you show a very low, ver low, um, low sized version of the image. If you're on a better network, you show a higher quality image. And if you're on a very good network, you show a 4K video of the chameleon in this case, right? I think this is a really neat approach and I will try at least to incorporate it in my uh, work, at least where it's applicable. So yeah, I'm guessing it's not gonna be applicable. Uh, applic yeah, let me try that again. It's not gonna be applicable anywhere, everywhere, but I definitely see use cases for that. The author even gives you 
an example of React components and how that would work, including the, you know, checks for the connection and uh, types and everything. So there's some code here. So if that sounds interesting, do have a look at the article. There are some pretty interesting thoughts here. All right, continuing, we got React's most basics. Um, just as you might imagine, this article gives you a very, very thorough introduction to what React.js is, how to use it, and uh, the whole thing behind it and JSX actually. And uh, even going further saying, you know, the, the famous, it's just JavaScript because well, it's just, it's really just JavaScript if you throw out the JSX, right? Which is a syntactic sugar essentially. So if you are still, uh, haven't tried React or want to have a really good in-depth introduction to it, then do have a look at this article. It gives you some pretty good uh, starting point basically. Right, next thing we got is yet another um, experience write-up. So this one is called What I Learned from Creating My First React App. And this is, as I already said, write-up about the experience from building the first React app. What was the pain points? What was the things that the author needed to know or had to learn to actually build a React app? how the author learned to rethink everything in sort of the reactive way or react, I mean, reactive way is wrong, right? Because React is not actually reactive per se, it's just the uh, core is reacting to data, but that's a different story. So it's not exactly reactive programming, but yes. So um, if you are thinking about starting React and not sure what to expect, then this article gives you a really good overview of uh, what you might need to know what you will will need to know and a sort of how do you approach the whole learning and uh, figuring out where to go basically. So it's a quite good one, highly recommended. Right, next thing we got is a crash course on serverless APIs with Express and MongoDB. Um, this is essentially a tutorial for a um, tool called serverless, uh, serverless framework, yeah, exactly. If you have not seen it, this is a, uh, Pretty neat one, I have not tried it myself, I just like looked at it and read the docs, but essentially it aims to abstract away the whole serverless infrastructure for you and allow you to write the app once and then deploy it in a serverless manner to Amazon, Azure, IBM, Google, whatever, basically whatever you can imagine, including kubeless. So there's like um, a lot of backends basically, or uh, providers, right? So this tutorial goes in to explain how to set everything up specifically on Amazon Web Services, how to configure all your instances and everything. I think they use the, um, what's the name of it? Uh, what was it? Clouds, oh, man, I keep forgetting. There should be, uh, was it? No, I think it wasn't the uh, Terraform or in your like clouds, whatever the hell it's called. Man, I'm forgetting things, but yeah, basically, it, teaches you how to set up the Amazon Web Services for it, teaches you how to configure the serverless to work with AWS, and then shows you how to create a service, a very simple one, and how to add functions to it, how to set up the MongoDB Atlas. Again, this is a um, hosted MongoDB service, so you don't actually have to configure anything. It's basically just sign up, press a few buttons, get an API key, and there you go. You have MongoDB that is managed for you which is quite neat, you know, and in some cases it might be better approach than hosting yourself because managing databases is, can be painful. Let's just put it this way. But yeah, if you are interested in serverless, then do have a look at this one. It is a pretty good tutorial and everything uh, that you might need to set up a basic CRUD up essentially uh, that uses hosted Mongo and then deploy it as a serverless app on Amazon Web Services. So pretty neat, really cool to see. Um, serverless framework tutorial actually, because I don't think I've seen one before that. Well, maybe I just haven't looked enough, you know. But yeah, uh, quite a good one, including monitoring, by the way, which is also quite important in things like this. But yeah, all right. Um, CloudFormation, that's what I was looking for. Uh, but whatever, let us continue. So the next thing we got is GraphQL and just um, snapshot testing. Just as you might imagine from the title, this is an introduction to using Jest and snapshot testing feature of Jest to test your GraphQL um, endpoint, right? So uh, again, I think that for things like this, snapshot testing in Jest is just a godsend feature and it will save you hours and hours of time instead of, you know, just trying to figure out what the hell should it be there. You can just say to match snapshot and 
then make sure the snapshot is correct. But um, yeah, this article essentially walks you through very basic setup. But uh, once you finish it, you should know everything you need to know about the snapshot testing and setup for GraphQL. I believe there was a link to the GitHub repo somewhere here, or maybe I'm mixing up the articles already. Uh, but anyway, there is any there is a bit of source code here, so that's not plain sort of theoretical article. So there is some code here to read. All right, continuing, we got uh, building a snipping tool with Electron, React, and Node.js. As you might imagine, this is uh, essentially the snipping tool. So if you're not familiar with the term snipping tool, it's uh, essentially a screenshot maker, right? So the or screenshot cutter, I guess, what we would call it, so that you can actually snip a bit of the screen and save it to file, right? So in this article walks you through creating an Electron app that would allow you to do that. And uh, UI is built in uh, React.js. So uh, it's very straightforward, the UI itself, right? Because I mean, come on, you don't really need for a snipper an extremely complicated UI. You either want a full screen snip or you want a crop from the uh, full screen capture. So it's not extremely complicated and it's not exactly an amazing hard uh, thing to build essentially, right? But uh, I, I mean, in terms of UI, but it does show you how to actually use Electron to capture the screenshots. They do, I believe they do only work with the primary displays you can see here from the uh, source code. So if you wanna build one, you can, you have space to improve upon basically, because uh, once again, this is basically gonna work only on the main screen, uh, main screen or, or primary screen if you have multi-monitor setup or on the window contents. Um, I don't know, like, do they actually talk about capturing it on different screens? Because I don't really see that in the source code at least. Maybe in the complete source code it is. Uh, I mean, I think they had a, yeah, they have a GitHub link. So if you just wanna jump and look at the source code, you can do that. If you want an explanation, it's also here. So it's pretty well written and quite easy to understand. So go ahead um, and read it if you are interested in building something like this. Also, I don't think, that uh, making a snipping tool with Electron for everyday use is a good idea simply due to the resource consumption. And you know, you actually want something like this to leave in your system tray and just capture things, right? So this is why you use like ShareX or whatever, the native apps that actually do it in a few kilobytes of RAM, not megabytes as the Electron would, which is well, um, set state of the, or set truth, I guess, about the Electron apps, right? It's, it's like there are trade-offs as usual. All right, continuing, we got learn this JavaScript fundamentals and become a better developer. Um, just as you can expect from the title, the article talks about JavaScript fundamentals and it not just says, hey, you have to learn this, this, and this to be a better JavaScript developer, but it actually explains all of those fundamentals. So if you are in need of um, either learning the fundamentals or strengthening and upping your game, this is a really good article to read because it does give you quite a lot of insight into the whole JavaScript fundamentals that you are, like it's basically really good to know those and they, it will save you a lot of time and pain to understand how all of those things work. And as you can see, the article is quite big and uh, talks about quite a lot of things. So um, if you are looking for something like this, do have a look at this one, it is quite good. All right, continuing, we got isomorphic ES modules. Um, tutorial basically, or I'm not sure I would call it a tutorial, it's more of a discussion article that talks about, yeah, one weird trick to share modules with browser and side script. So the idea is that the isomorphic usually means in JavaScript world, at least, there's something that runs on the server and on the client and does the same thing, right? So like isomorphic fetch, for example, is something you can run in Node.js and something you can run in the browser. So this article goes into the uh, sort of discussion on how exactly do you build a module that will be isomorphic. And again, it's, an, it's um, talking about the ES module and uh, talking about, um, I think that's yeah, basically using the already modules format in browser and then just requires in uh, Node.js, not sure why not use the ES modules. I mean, they are experimental, but come on, they work pretty much fine. Not a fan of, of MJS extension, but that's a different story. Right, and uh, yes, again, though, we have the, um, the core case for those isometric modules is of course server-side rendering, right? Because you cannot really, 
use the same modules. Uh, so for example, the one of my um, like frequently used modules that I have to work with is Leaflet. It's a really great module that allows you to render maps, right? The problem with it is that you cannot actually render leaflet or use leaflet on the server rendered HTML. So it would be really nice to see an isomorphic leaflet that, for example, renders the leaflet to canvas on the server, I guess. I, that probably should be possible or maybe to image. I don't know. That's, uh, maybe, I should, maybe I should do it myself, actually. That sounds like a really cool uh, library project. But yeah, basically, if you are interested in uh, sort of approaches to building isomorphic modules, do have a look at this article. It is pretty good. There is a lot of uh, good thoughts in here and a lot of pretty good codes, which you can learn from, you know, and uh, yeah, let us continue, I guess. All right, next thing we got is faceapi.js, JavaScript API for face recognition in the browser using TensorFlow, yeah, with TensorFlow.js, is what I want to say. So this is again from uh, Vincent Muller, uh, the, you probably saw the similar article a few months ago. I think I even covered it in one of the BXGS weeklies. This is an author of OpenCV for Node. And there was like a bunch of articles that he has like a lot of them there, this face detection one. And uh, yes, it was exactly Node.js plus OpenCV for face recognition. So this one is um, quite similar, but instead of talking about Node.js, it actually talks about using TensorFlow.js in uh, browser, right? Because come on, it's GPU accelerated, it uses WebGL and it's amazing, let's be honest. And this article guides you through setting up the project, uh, figuring out how to do that using TensorFlow and then building the face recognition, even like the distance uh, matching or like a, distance calculation between two images. And of course it has code and I believe the library is published on GitHub. So again, if you wanna skip the article itself and just have a look at the source code, although I would not recommend it because the article is really cool and uh, quite interesting to read, you can just jump into the GitHub repo and have a look at the library. Also, if you're not interested in building it, but you actually wanna just use it, the library is available and published on NPM and uh, basically, you know, you can just uh, check it out and use it for face detection. So it's TensorFlow based, so probably works really, really good. Um, right, let us continue. The next thing we got is managing complex waiting experiences on web UIs. Um, not strictly JavaScript um, article, but I thought it would be very interesting because, you know, once you're writing JavaScript, you will write the UI at some point and it's quite important, I think, to manage waiting experiences in any UI, not just web UI. So in this case, the author talks about web UI specifically, but this is something that basically any UI UX person has to work with, right? And I think it's good to know what to do and how it works, even for people who are not considering themselves uh, sort of UI experts or UX experts, it's still good to know about those things, right? So. It's basically there's it's a pretty thorough article goes from definition of waiting and a bunch of features or feats I guess that it has and uh, then it goes like through examples and through uh, more specific examples in terms of web apps so like splash screens talking about the activity indicators non-blocking uh, loading indicators like the YouTube one and so on and so forth so it's again if you are even a tiny bit interested in UIs, I generally, yeah. <laughs> words elude me today, let me try again. I genuinely recommend you read through this or at least skim through it because there's a lot of images that will tell you a lot more than the text, I guess. You know, the text is still good and complimentary, but it's good to know. And uh, yes, there is a view implementation of all of those best practices that you can just uh, use in your project. So it would be cool to see something like this for React as well. Probably someone will fork it. We will talk about view wait a bit uh, after that in the uh, libraries and demos section. Let us continue. The next article we got is called React Native, a retrospective from the mobile engineering team at Udacity. So this is one more of those. Uh, we had the one from Airbnb last time. Uh, this one is more or less the same. I mean, in terms of uh, the depth and the explanation of, you know, why they picked the React Native, how did it go? What did they figure out? How did the team react it? 
And there's like, I won't go through all of that because there is a lot of things in here. And as you can see, it's very thorough. And uh, once again, if you're interested in learning more about React Native and how does React Native fits the different problems, why the UDS depicted in the first place, did they go with it? How did they, you know, how did they figure it out if they want it or not? Um, have a look. So there's, yeah, can we definitely say whether or not React Native is right for you? No, because nobody, but you can say that, right? Because it's like, it's very use case specific. And the more of those retrospectives you read, the better you will understand the, what are the good fit for React Native and maybe it will help you decide if you want to pick it or not. So uh, highly recommend it. All right, continuing, we got why you should already be using CSS Grid, a really cool tutorial on CSS Grid, uh, what it is, how it works, uh, how you can build very basic things, including the uh, code here, which you can you know check out with the CSS and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, there's also a brief comparison with um, Flexbox at some point. There you go, yeah, right, so th there we go. So the problems that uh, like the things that you can do with CSS grid, not all of that is possible with Flexbox. Like you can achieve it kind of, but it's going to be way harder than with CSS grid. But then again, um, CSS grid and Flexbox are kind of two different tools. So anyway, if you are interested in CSS grid and building uh, layouts with it, then have a look at this article. It gives you a pretty good starting point. All right. Continuing, we got mscripten's compiled WebAssembly used minimally. So this is a very in-depth article talking about using C, C++ and mscripten to compile C and C++ to WebAssembly and use it within JavaScript, right? So as the author talks in the very beginning, the main problem of mscripten is that when you compile WebAssembly, you don't just get the VASM file that you can run as a library, but you also get the JavaScript boilerplate, you also get an HTML harness, and then you get like at least 100K or so WebAssembly and you know, it's quite bloated. So then you got the JS uh, wrapper around it. It's, it's more or less the same as we've seen in Golang uh, WebAssembly module that we was building on Wednesday. So the author goes to ask, you know, can we actually do it better? Can we do it smaller? Can we remove all these unnecessary things? And, um, he built the library, or I guess, uh, yeah, I think it was he, right? I'm not, yes, it was he. Uh, he built the my minimal library that converts uh, PNG, um, reads a PNG file, uh, boom, 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 boom. Okay, so it just reads the PNG file. I don't think it does anything to it and uh, probably does, I like, uh, to be honest, didn't have enough time to look at the actual code, but uh, the interesting part is not the library itself. The interesting part is actually the whole uh, thing with uh, interaction with the memory from WebAssembly, mscripten's uh, things like with the wrapper, the stack and uh, memory um, interact, again, memory interact, why am I saying memory interaction so much? Because I mean, okay, <laughs> it is about memory a lot, right? Um, and then look at the WebAssembly itself, the generated WebAssembly actually to figure out what, uh, what is actually going on. So the, he actually uses the VASM to VAT, uh, the VAT being the uh, human readable WebAssembly code to figure out how is the result looks and um, what is, you know, what's the, for example, how much space does malloc require? There's a lot of very interesting question here where a lot of very interesting insights into WebAssembly and function tables and all that kind of stuff, memory usage strings, structures, and so on and so forth, right? So uh, this is from the author of the posts uh, who built the fast GIF that I demoed last podcast or two podcasts ago, which was pretty cool, like this uh, GIF parsing library written in WebAssembly. And uh, yeah, so there is quite a lot of interesting things. So if you're interested in WebAssembly, Definitely have a look at this one because there is a lot of really uh, cool insights and uh, some very interesting points. Right, continuing, we got web components and Angular and Angular JS. Um, okay, so this is basically Angular Elements introduction, which is a library, I believe, for um, using web components within Angular, right? So web components are universal standard, uh, but you cannot really use them in Angular just like this because 
Well, Angular tries to figure out the components uh, using the engine itself. So I think you need a wrapper for it. I might be mistaken here. Once again, I'm not exactly an Angular guy, but this is at least my understanding. So this Angular Elements library provides you a sort of web components on steroids for Angular, right? And this uh, article goes through explanation of how it works, what you can actually do with it, including examples, obviously. So um, if you are using Angular, if you are, are interested in, in web components and you want to use them within your Angular project, do have a look at this article, it's pretty cool. Uh, by the way, if you didn't know, you can actually export both Angular, uh, React, and Vue into web components. So you can actually build a component in React, for example, and then compile it to web component. There's plenty of tools like this. So if you're interested in working it the other way around, you can do that too. Okay, continuing, we got a Node.js perspective on MongoDB 4.0 transactions. So if you didn't know MongoDB 4.0, um, I think it's been released already, I believe. I don't remember if it was um, still in beta. Yeah, it is generally available now. So it's been released and it finally has transactions, asset compilant for everything, you know, so everything you ever dreamt in a, in a database, it's now there, it's now asset, it's now great with transactions and everything and people can stop nagging about it. Now, this article basically is a tutorial on using those transactions from JavaScript, specifically two cases. So first one using its official MongoDB driver, uh, which is pretty straightforward, right? So you just start a session, you start a transaction, then you do whatever the hell you want, then you commit the transaction, and then you end the session. So it seems to be very straightforward, actually, to use. And then exactly the same, but using Mongoose. So uh, obviously, Mongoose at uh, 5.2, I believe, yeah, as they say, they've added the transaction support. API seems to be very similar, but you know, you get a bit of uh, Mongoose sugar on top, which is always good. Um, so yeah, if you're working with MongoDB and we're interested in transactions or need them, yeah, or need them for whatever reason in your app, then do have a look at this article, it will give you a pretty good starting point. Okay, next article we have is building API with Express.js and Hadron. This is essentially a tutorial or introduction, I guess, both for Hadron, which is a lightweight open source framework. Um, again, they say it's a lightweight open source framework uh, that can be used with other tools, but I still like after reading this article, I'm not sure I understand what the hell is that supposed to do. It seems to be sort of a dependency injection, injection framework, but not quite because it also provides the other features right? And um, they also claim that it does not affect performance. And they tested it using this API benchmark, which is like, I, it's very, like you, <laughs> the claims like this always each me the wrong way. Like, you know, they do provide, at least they do provide a benchmark to support it. But I, will never believe that adding another framework does not affect the performance at all. Like that, that cannot be true, right? So that's probably something you will still get an overhead, right? It might not be under those circumstances, because come on, this benchmark is probably was run on one configuration with a specific, with a specific, uh, okay, so we see the benchmark itself. And I don't see, I don't really see any Junior inter okay, so they, they don't really describe like normally when you benchmark something, you provide the environment, right? So because benchmark without the environment is kind of useless. So we don't know what kind of RAM they had. We don't know what kind of uh, CPU they had. We don't know what other processes were running and so on and so forth. So this saying that, hey, this thing does not really give any overhead in some mysterious circumstances is just it just me the wrong way. I mean, they might not. I mean, I'm not saying they're lying, right? It's just a bit weird. I would prefer to see a more concrete data and maybe a real world data running on a production server tested there with like a real world app and stuff like this, you know, but um, anyway, if you're looking for a dependency, I guess it's a dependency ejection framework, because it looks like one like really, you know, you just it also has like, a bunch of additional libraries, I guess, like Hadron serialization that allows you to serialize things. And then there's like Hadron events. And 
it's I yeah, there's there's a GitHub obviously for it, and we're gonna have a look at it again when we come to the uh, libraries and demos. But I just I'm still not sure I understand what the hell is this thing does. If you know, do let me know because it would be very interesting to kind of understand it. But I just honestly don't have enough time to uh, spend to you know dig into it to figure out what the hell's going on. All right, continuing, we got multi-server chat in Node without database. Really, really cool article talking about building a node-based chat that is built around the mesh architecture. So this is purely peer-to-peer -peer chat that works without any sort of database and the clients uh, send the messages between themselves, right? So this is the sort of the mesh, uh, the way the mesh topology works. Uh, the article itself doesn't really include too much source code. It's mostly um, sort of generic and uh, related to architecture and the concepts and stuff like this. But there is a link to the resulting code, which you can find on the GitHub. There we go. So there's the uh, client and server. And uh, if you're interested in any sort of peer-to-peer -peer technologies or, you know, sort of peer-to-peer -peer chats or mesh topologies, maybe that's your thing. This is a really, really cool one, highly recommended to read through. And I have not checked out the code myself yet, but I am planning to because it sounds really cool and I would be interested to see how it's actually made. All right, continuing, we got debugging node code in VS Code. Uh, this is essentially a very, very big tutorial, which is also available in video format on using the debugger in VS Code uh, with uh, for debugging the Node.js. So there's a lot of images here that basically walks you through step by step into how to launch Node program, how to set up breakpoints, how to do, how to inspect the stack and all that kind of stuff. It's, um, I don't know if it's actually too different from the official docs. I guess it's a bit more detailed because the doc documentation for VS Code is quite amazing if you didn't know. But it does give you a few additional things here and there. So, you know, if you wanted to get uh, to understand basically how to use VS Code Debugger, which, by the way, is quite amazing and you should learn it, then this is a really good starting point. All right. Continuing, we got a Node.js API on Ado. Yeah. Let's try again. Node.js APIs on Amazon Web Services, the pros and cons of Express versus serverless. So this is a comparison of using Express.js and using serverless architectures. Um, specifically, uh, here they compare using Express app on Amazon Web Services EC2 instance using like packaged with Docker and deployed there and comparing it with serverless framework. Once again, that we already talked about today. So, um, yeah, it's essentially what you would expect, right? So you got it's there's some weirdness here, like they compare the index.js from Express with uh, index YAML, which is actually a definition for the servers. In this case, not the actual code, which just sounds a bit weird. And um, other than that, I mean, it's more of a high level comparison, you know, with all like learning curves and scalability and development speed and costs. Um, they, there was this weird, was it in this article? There was like, yeah, you can do it actually for free, which was, yeah, there you go. We can now run our APS for free, which is like, yeah, okay. So in this case, it's like, okay. They actually mentioned, so you get 1 million requests for free for each month. Amazon Web Services, let me just say this. Amazon Web Services is an amazing service and they do give you a lot for free. The problem is if you're not careful, you can get incredibly high bills that will just, destroy your company. That's like, that's not even a joke. So if you're not careful with how you architecture your thing around Amazon Web Services, it can backfire spectacularly. So be really, really careful with this. But if you know what you're doing, yes, you can actually, like those guys managed to get their API for free. <laughs> that's just amazing when you think about it, right? And Amazon Web Services Lambda is really easy to use and uh, very, very fast. So, you know, if you are looking into that area and if you think you're, um project fits this kind of architecture do have a look at it because there is some definitely some interesting thoughts in here right continuing we got react is just javascript yes yet yet again yet again article that's talking about react and uh react being just javascript and a lot of people who i know hate that but um it like really it's all the article is talks about is that you can actually use react without any that pack 
parcels, builds pipelines, or you know, you can just throw in an index HTML, you can throw in the React like this using React development and React DOM development, right? So for debugging. And you can just write simple JavaScript. You don't need JSX, right? JSX compiles to JavaScript in the end. So if you learn how exactly it compiles into JavaScript, you can just use JavaScript, right? It might not be very nice to write, or I guess not as nice to write as JSX. I definitely prefer JSX, for example, but I know that it is possible to write React code without JSX, right? And considering we now have class support in browsers, you can just write it without any build steps. You can play with it using just one index HTML and one index JS file, right? It's, it's not that hard. So um, if you are interested in trying out React but was scared by all the build steps and web packs and parcels and all that kind of stuff, and just still wanna try it, and you are not afraid to try writing React by hand or JSX bit by hand, I mean, it's not extremely hard, it's just you know not as nice as I said, then do have a look at this article. It does gives you a really good starting point and explains what you can actually do. All right, next thing we got is optimization auditing, a deep dive into Chrome's dev console. I'm not sure why it's called optimization auditing because it doesn't really talk, talks about optimization auditing. It talks about Chrome's dev console. So really, really in depth, look at the Chrome's dev tools and console and what you can actually do with it. If you didn't know, the Chrome Dev Console is extremely powerful and has two billion features that can help you debug and profile and optimize your website. And this article talks exactly about this. It talks about using snippets, using history, using different features like preserve log, using stores global variable, using console log, using console table, console assert, and all that kind of stuff. There's like, Two million. I mean, look, look at the size. Of, like all of this is talking about how do you use the Chrome Web Console, so um, Dev Console. So if you didn't know all the features, and maybe if you did know some of them, I would highly recommend reading through the whole article, and then maybe heading to the official Dev Tool docs and looking at them because this this tiny tiny thing contains incredible amounts of hidden features that you would know about without actually reading the documentation. So it's a really good article to start. Okay, next thing we got is what is a Redux, a designer's guide. As you might imagine from the description uh, or from the title, I guess, it's a very designer-friendly introduction to what the Redux is. And I guess it will work for just about anyone else because it's really well written and it's very easy to understand. So if you were still confused what Redux is, or if you just wanted to get on the hype train and uh, you know, I guess hype train is already left, right? Nobody likes Redux anymore. So if you wanted to know what the Redux is and was still confused by the official docs and by some Twitter statements, then this article is a really, really good explanation in a very simple language that will tell you what the Redux is, how it works, but it has some really cool illustrations here explaining what the hell's going on. So yeah, um, once again, really, really cool. And they call it for designer, I mean, designer's guide, but I don't know, like I feel that it's useful for everyone because I just found it to be deli absolutely delightful. Even though, you know, I know what Redux is, I know how it works. Um, it still was really cool to read that. <laughs> so yeah, do have a look at that if you are still confused what Redux is or maybe about some of its parts because um, this article does goes into quite in depth into basically explaining all the bits and uh, pieces of Redux. Right, next thing we got is cooking a Deliveroo clone with Nuxt, Vue.js, GraphQL, Strapi, and Stripe. Um, I'm not sure what delivery is. I imagine it's like a food delivery thing. Yeah, it seems to be food delivery thing. So this is uh, building a clone of it uh, using Nuxt.js, which is the next JS for with Vue under hood, right? GraphQL, Stripe, and Strapi. So if you ever wanted to build essentially a full e-commerce website that does food delivery, I'm not sure why food delivery, but whatever, um, then this will give you a full on tutorial on that starting from the scratch essentially, right? So Nuxt.js does provide you a really nice boilerplate, but you will add the GraphQL, you will add the 
Strapi, the um, uh, CMS. It is a headless CMS, so you have to build the UI yourself. Um, trying to watch the stream and match it. This, watch the. Wait, what? You just broke my brain. Trying to watch the stream and watch the match at the same. Wait, what? Oh, there's a, there's a football guy. <laughs> I picked the wrong time to stream. I think I completely forgot that there's a football. I'm not a big football fan, so it is. <laughs> yeah, I know that Russia is playing, but man, I'm not a huge football fan and uh, kind of not really tracking it that much beyond you know the whole Twitter hype. But whatever. But <laughs> let's continue with JavaScript. I find it way more fascinating than football, to be honest. <laughs> All right, so yeah, uh, Strapi as a headless CMS and the Stripe as a payment processor. Um, going from ground up and building your basically uh, food delivery network, including, so I think the most interesting part for a lot of people would probably be uh, payment bit, right? So this is a seven part article, seven part article. Yes, this is just the first part as you can see over here. So, it is quite in depth and talks about just everything you have to do from the scratch to build your own shop, essentially, right? Uh, including the, as I said, the most interesting part for a lot of people payment API with Stripe specifically. All right, continuing, we got an adventure in sparse arrays. So uh, it's a pretty cool article looking into the holes in arrays and how to exactly identify them, right? So um, the holes is something like this, right? So this array has one hole, for example, because a from zero is undefined, but this is a value a from one is also undefined. But the thing is that this is considered a value while this is considered a hole. So this article goes into explain why is this, how is this different and how you actually detect holes gives you a bunch of different options to do that. And you know, you can actually do it with maps, how you can map it and so on and so forth. So it is pretty cool. And if you are interested in more in-depth look into arrays, I guess, then do have a look at this this one. It's also have a bit uh, interesting insights into um, size creation, like arrays creation, I guess, and how to clear holes, uh, which is pretty interesting. For example, the spread transforms holes into undefined, which is something that you can use, I guess, to filter them out if you know that all of your values are defined. All right, next thing we got is building mobile apps with Capacitor and Vue.js. So uh, this is an interesting thing, right? So there's there's been Apache Cordova and Adobe PhoneGap, the two uh, projects that's been essentially uh, for building the, or I guess for wrapping the web apps into native shells. And both of them are been out there for quite some time. And now, uh, so there's been this um, project called Ionic, which is, where is it? There we go. Which is essentially, I believe it's based on Angular and PhoneGap. So essentially you just, you know, write Angular and then I think it was Angular, maybe not anymore because I haven't actually checked it out for a long, long time. But basically it's a framework for building a mobile app, right? And it's, it's, I think it's quite a good one. So it's like, there's like a lot of things here, including native elements that look very nice and it all builds together. It has like really good tools, really good documentation, it seems to be enterprise ready, enterprise friendly, and a lot of like enterprises use it and praise it. And it looks like they were not exactly happy about using PhoneGap and Cordova. So they were like, okay, now we're gonna build our own thing, which is Capacitor. So it's still in beta, but you can already use it. And this article walks you through, first of all, what Capacitor is, what kind of features does it have, what kind of requirements does it have. And then it walks you through using Capacitor with Vue.js to actually build a native app, right? So, which is pretty cool, I think. So it's really uh, nice to see that there are more players than just, you know, the Adobe and Apache Foundation, essentially. And I would be very curious to see where this leads. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to build a web app that is wrapped in a native shell, then this might be a pretty interesting option. Right, next thing we got is recreating Python slice syntax in JavaScript using ES6 proxies. Um, Above everything, this article is really cool look into what ES6 proxies can actually do and what they can provide you in terms of 
uh, source code, but it's also really cool to see how you can implement the features from other languages in JavaScript using the proxies, right? So obviously you would need to wrap your arrays into this helper proxy, but it is possible to actually achieve the Python um, array syntax in JavaScript. So if you didn't know, slicing in Python is really cool. And what you can actually do is you can provide either the negative indexes or you can provide start stop index to slice the array from start to stop or if you provide the negative index, it will go backwards, right? Uh, it also can be just the end or just the start. So removing the first element or the last element and things like this. Really, really cool syntax. I'm not sure why the ES uh, or I guess ECMAScript still didn't steal it because it's just makes so much sense. <laughs> but uh, I mean, basically this article walks you through implementing the syntax on JavaScript arrays using proxy, right? So, um, Obviously, it's when you think about it, it's actually quite simple to do, but it does take some, well, regular expressions for once. <laughs> so it's a really cool write up. And if you are interested to see how exactly you can do that, do have a look at this article. It gives you quite in depth look into all of that and Python as well. And yes, a crossover episode, exactly. All right, next thing we got is an article from Rust, guys. Our vision for Wasm by Jan. And it essentially outlines the vision for WebAssembly bind gen tool that is allows you to uh, create binds from WebAssembly to JavaScript, right? And they say that, okay, we want to actually share ECMAScript. We want to share the web APIs. We don't want to break or change the uh, Rust ecosystem. We want to be it sort of addition to it, which makes perfect sense. But if you are looking into the whole Rust world, then have a look at this article. You will get quite a lot of uh, interesting insights. Right, next thing we got is another article from the Mozilla team. This um, this one is called Making Calls to WebAssembly Fast and Implementing NREF. It talks about a bunch of bugs that was filed against the SpiderMonkey engine, the uh, JavaScript engine that Mozilla Firefox uses, right? And uh, the way that it worked before and the way it's gonna work now and how it's gonna improve the speed of WebAssembly parsing and it's going to improve the memory usage. I mean, just look at those improvements. It's insane. This is time in milliseconds. Just look at this. <laughs> like, look at this difference. It's crazy. And then there's again the uh, memory saving as well. So the new approach that they uh, implemented, the lazy stop generation, actually decreased the memory usage beyond the baseline, which is just insane. Um, we're going to have another... Uh, WebAssembly related, like we actually have quite a bunch of WebAssembly related articles. I was thinking maybe, should we have a WebAssembly specific section in the podcast? What do you guys think? Is that something that you would want to see or should I just throw them in together with the JavaScript articles? Let me know in the comments or in the chat. Okay, but yeah, some really, really cool work. There's a lot of technical details here talking about the implementation. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, do have a look. There is some very, very cool stuff. Right, next thing we got another uh, WebAssembly article. As I already said, there's a bunch of them this week. Uh, this one is called a real world WebAssembly benchmark and uh, it's a WebAssembly benchmark from PSPDF kit guys. So if you didn't know, PSPDF kit is the uh, SDK that allows you to sort of use the draw on the PDFs and fill out the forms and do stuff like this. And they built the benchmark around it, right? So you can actually run it in your browser. It works using WebAssembly, it does a yeah, it now has five stages, uh, uses different things. So tests like rendering pages, searching a term, exporting, creating annotations, and you will get a score. So it runs a bunch of times. You'll get like specific score and then you can see the details of it. I believe it is open source. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, so uh, they even have a version for browsers that don't support Masm, which is pretty cool. And uh, what I found interesting is not, yeah, there you go. There's a link to GitHub. I remember I saw it somewhere. The interesting thing that I found here is that actually how much uh, the Firefox is ahead of everyone else on the WebAssembly speed, right? So this lower score is better here. So, and as you can see here, the difference between the Chrome 69 and Firefox 61 is just insane. So the Red one is without WebAssembly, uh, the JavaScript fallback, so no WebAssembly. And in this case, Firefox, uh, Chrome actually wins, right? So the, we know that V8 has incredible uh, JavaScript optimizations and it's been winning JavaScript game for a long time. But when you look at the JavaScript 
bit or sorry WebAssembly bit you can see that Firefox is twice even more than twice more efficient than Chrome which is just insane and this is before that article that we just saw the way they implemented more improvements to WebAssembly so this is kind of crazy when you think about it it is really really cool uh, like I'm, I'm curious now that we have this benchmark and you know as soon as we get the benchmarks they all the uh, V8 and Spider Monkey and Edge team will start competing to see who can optimize better for it. <laughs> so we're going to see some uh, crazy improvements at some point. So I'm really excited to see how it's going to how it's going to change the game basically. So, you know, having those benchmarks is always really cool. All right, next thing we got is Golang 111 WebAssembly for Gophers. So this is not JavaScript article, this is actually a Golang article, but it talks about using Golang to compile it to WebAssembly and uh, run it in browser to uh, interact with the JavaScript, right? Starting from a very simple hello WebAssembly and going into a more complex um, thing, basically invoking the uh, um, setting the global callbacks and so on and so forth. So uh, if you're interested in using Golang to build WebAssembly libraries or WebAssembly apps, then have a look. This will basically teach you everything you need to know, at least the basics. I also did a live stream on that last Wednesday. So if you're interested, you can have a look on my YouTube channel uh, to see me working on that. One thing I did not find last time was invoking callbacks. And uh, this is why it's awesome because, you know, uh, this is why it's awesome that I have you guys because once I finished building it, I actually got a pull request right here from uh, Mr. F double, um, like, man, sorry, I'm really sorry, but I don't know, F vein. I'm not sure how to read your username. I'm truly sorry, <laughs> but thank you so much for this pull request that showed me how to, whoops, how to actually do a callback. So you can do a callback. I was just too stupid to find it. We can actually just use dot invoke in Golang to uh, send a callback. And you know, this is really cool. Thank you very much for sending this. But yes, if you are interested in WebAssembly and Golang, you can uh, either read the article or have a look at my video and my YouTube channel. And uh, yes, learn how to do that. It still seems to have quite a lot of overhead uh, because of the WebAssembly limitations, but uh, still a really, really cool starting point at least. Uh, we're gonna see how that develops. All right, next thing we got is uh, announcing Code Sandbox dashboard in Teams. So uh, Code Sandbox has been my sort of sandbox of choice where I build small things and show them off and share them with people for quite some time. They have a really cool editor. Now they've added the dashboard where you can finally see all your projects in a simple way, not the way that it was before. So it's way easier now. And they also have now teams when you invite people to work with you on a project, they will automatically join your current session. So you now have actually live collaboration, which was a bit of a pain before. So yeah, they just, you know, adding more and more cooler things. So um, if you didn't know about it, check it out. It is really great. If you already used it, well, then now you probably already know about that. So yeah. Right. Next thing we got is this uh, Hacker News thread, which is called Ask Hacker News, what you wish you'd known before getting into JavaScript. Uh, as you can see here, it is a pretty lengthy thread. There's quite a lot of it, really interesting insight in here from people who has been working for quite some time. And uh, for people who has been both working a lot in JavaScript and for people who has just switched into JavaScript because they either need to do front end work or they just, uh, you know, decided to learn it. There's a lot of really cool insights on what they wish they knew before doing that. Like a lot of them are really, really interesting and really, really helpful. So if you are either just getting into JavaScript or you're switching to JavaScript from other languages, do have a look at the thread. Be sure to read the, at least the top comments. There is a lot of very cool thoughts in there and a lot of really uh, solid points and uh, some really good discussion as it uh, sometimes happens on Hacker News. Let's put it this way. All right. Um, and I think this is the last thing we got in the articles. Um, another amazing performance improvement from V8 team, uh, not yet in WebAssembly area, once again in JavaScript area, but the spinning up object spread. So here's the really something I found super interesting. So this is the performance of spread uh, in object design, which is, you know, sort of the old way of doing spread. 
spread polyfill from Babel and native spread. Just look at this difference. This is insane. And the higher score is better. So this is like, I don't even know how many times, 40 times better, I guess, even more than that, right? So this is like, no, four times, no, eh, a lot, basically a lot of times better, like five, six times, I don't know. This just, yeah, Babel, like, I mean, you still need Babel for some things, right? I guess, I mean, it, it purely depends on what kind of things you target, right? So the old browsers obviously still don't support this. But if you are targeting the, uh, say, Node.js, right, the latest stable or LTS, you can just, like, you don't need Babel unless you want import syntax, but then you can use something like ESM and then you don't need Babel again. I personally stopped using Babel for like 90% of stuff, unless it's like Next.js that already includes it, so I don't have to configure it myself, you know, because it's just a pain in the ass. But just look at this performance, it's insane. Uh, if I'm only doing Chrome and well, Safari is uh, Safari is quirky, like Safari is one of those uh, people are saying that Safari is new Internet Explorer for a reason, you know, it's been lagging behind quite heavily. So I don't, especially the mobile Safari, like mobile Safari is just pain in ass. So you probably still need Babel. I, I mean, you would still. So the thing is that you could still check the devices you target you check if they support all the features you use and then maybe you can drop Babel. So you have your user statistics, right? So you know if you can drop it or not. It's quite easy to find out. Uh, there's also quite a way, by the way, pretty interesting discussion below from uh, Mr. Further and Dutney, who is uh, one of the V8 engineers as well, I believe, uh, or Google engineers, hell if I remember. Oh, he's actually at PayPal now, okay. But uh, he's delving in all C, C++ area and a lot of time, I think, contributing to V8. Uh, there's a discussion, why is it faster than object design? So if you're interested, make sure to read the thread as well. There's some interesting things in there. All right, now we got to the releases section. Don't really have that much of them. Again, we are, you know, July, summer, everything is on, everyone's on vacation and everyone's just chilled and don't want to release anything. Still got some things. Um, first one being Node.js version 10.6. The major highlight being the DNS promises version. So the promisification of core modules is sort of slowly progressing, which is really awesome to see. I believe at some point we're going to see the full uh, API promisified and then you can just wait everything, which is great. And uh, yeah, everything else is more or less minor things that are, uh, well, you can read about them yourselves. All right. Next thing we got is React Native 0.56. Somehow React Native is still not version 1.0. I'm still not sure why that's a thing. I think at some point they're just gonna release like, you know, like the React went from version uh, 0.11 to version 12 or something, I believe. So it's probably gonna be like, we are no longer React Native 0.56. We're now React Native 57. And everyone will be like, so where does the other 56 go? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so, oh yeah, there you go. They actually talk about when to release here. I somehow missed that bit. Um, right, the big changes, Babel 7, uh, modernizing Android support, new nodes, Xcodes, React and Flow. So there's a lot of updated dependencies, basically. I think that's the major uh, highlight of the whole release. So it doesn't seem to be anything, you know, super majorly changed, so there's probably a lot of fixes. And uh, I mean, you can have a look at the, um, wait a second, let me turn off the night highlights because that's a bit too yellow for me right now. I'm gonna fall asleep. All right, but yeah, you can have a look at uh, change log yourself if you are interested. Uh, it seems to be more of a maintenance release and you know version updates and stuff like this. Right, next thing we got is VS Code version 125. Well, certainly the VS Code team is not on vacation and they keep delivering amazing things months after months. So we finally got a grid layout. So you can actually have a grid like this now and uh, it's all draggable, all resizable as you can see here on the GIFs and you can just, you know, persist empty groups or close them automatically. You can split it, you can drag the windows around. You can change the editor layout from the panel now, which is, I, I guess it's not something I actually personally use. At least I sometimes use it for previews of markdown files, but not really for anything else. But you know, if you are using like this, uh, if you are using features like this, then it's probably really good for you because I know that some people heavily rely on the grids. Um, aside from that, they've added uh, what was there? Oh yeah, there is now this uh, really cool thing with um, 
Oh man, what was the duh, 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 duh. uh what was the CSS thing? TypeScript. Ah oh, yeah, there we go. So for the CSS, they now actually show you the supported browser uh, supported browsers. Um, I can't imagine working on any other editor except yeah, exactly. VS Code is just insanely good. It's like compared to everything else, it's been doing like the team behind it has been doing incredible work. Like just look at the all. Look at this. You can now get CSS supported browsers right in the documentation inside of your code, which is just, it's just so good. You don't even have to install any extensions. It's just baked in. Just look at this. And uh, yeah, that's obviously there's like two tons of other enhancements as you can see, you know, as, as usual. Come on, just look at this change log. This is one month of work. It's insane. Come on. Right, but yeah, if you're interested, have a look. I think the grid layout is essentially the um, uh, highlights as, yes, portable mode is as well. So if you are one of those people who work in a extremely restrictive environments at work that don't allow you to install any software without your admin standing and being like, yeah, do you want to install this stuff? You can now just download it and pack it and run it. And it also works on USB drive. So there you go. Portable mode is great as well. All right. Let us continue. Uh, the next thing we got is NPM version 6.20 next. So this is pre-release. Uh, it's coming with a no update notifier, which disables the update notifications. I don't know why would you want to do that, but uh, I guess it's great to have. Uh, and it now has suggestions for run scripts, which will basically say, did you mean, which is pretty great uh, if it basically tries to figure it out. Other than that, there's mostly like fixes and some documentation changes or so nothing major. I mean, it is a minor release, so you know, don't really expect anything major from it. Right, next thing we got is React Beautiful Drag and Drop 8.0, 23% faster, 18% smaller. And there's yeah, a lot of other changes. Uh, if you didn't know about it, this is a really cool drag and drop library from Atlassian guys, which is basically used in uh, I think it is used now in um, Trello and uh, you worked with this. Yeah, I think it's one of the most popular libraries for React for drag and drop. And I mean, for a reason, it seems to be really, really cool. I think I used it in one of my projects, but it really didn't go that far. But I remember it was really easy to use and was really fun. So yeah, if you're looking for a drag and drop thing, Definitely give it a look. It's now version 8, 8 or 802 actually already. So, you know. All right. Um, next thing we got is React Window Alpha 4, which is a really, uh, has a bunch of really cool demos. So it is basically um, rendering thing. It seems to be very, I guess, related to React Virtualize. So it allows you to render um, only the things that you see basically, right? So there's like, as you can see here, there's a 999 items and I quickly scroll through them, but we only rendered 145 of them, which means that it is way more efficient, right? And uh, you can use it to do things like this, for example, which is also really, really cool. Yes, I already saw that, thank you very much. So this is a flame graph, right? And uh, this allows you to do cool things like this, like zooming into flame graph, which looks sleek as hell, to be honest. So if you're looking for something like this, do have a look at the um, React Window library. It's still an alpha, but uh, it's closing the release. And it's from the Mr. Brian Wong. So it should be really good. This guy knows how to code, right? <laughs> All right, next thing we got is, oh yeah, that's, that's actually it for releases. There was like literally not that many of them. So now we got a bunch of um, libraries and demos. I'm gonna start with Rogue. Uh, server-side rendering for React that's invisible, zero config and uh, quick. So it doesn't have, it doesn't rely on Webpack, but rather on Parcel, what is still faster than Webpack, it seems. And uh, I think once they release the new Parcel version, it's even gonna be more flexible than Webpack. Hopefully, you know, it's really hard to believe that, but at least that's what I read on Twitter. We're gonna see how that goes. But yeah, it basically seems to be zero config server-side rendering for React app. So you just, you know, you add it as a dependency and then you just say, it seems to be like Next.js inspired, I guess. And uh, yeah, it seems to be pretty simple and uh, pretty good if you just want server-side rendering. So it's literally zero config. You just do rogue start and it seems to work. Seems incredibly cool um, and works with the old existing apps essentially, right? So yeah, 
If you were looking for something like this, do I have a look? Seems pretty nifty. I personally rely on Next.js most of the time, so I don't know if I need that, but uh, maybe if I have my old legacy apps that don't use Next.js, I will have a look at that because it looks really cool. Right, next thing we got is Crip um, with K. Dead simple encryption using Web Crypto under the hood. If you ever tried to use Web Crypto, you know that it's a bit tricky to do that. Like, I mean, it's not the simplest thing. You definitely don't get decrypt and encrypt methods that are really simple to use. And this app, this library essentially does exactly that. It provides two simple methods that you just say, hey, encrypt me this value with this secret. Done. Uh, obviously, you can provide more options, right? So it allows you to pass the options object, which will actually contain the char set, IV size, parse function, stringify function, all that kind of stuff. So you can actually, you know, customize it to a decent extent. Uh, so if you are looking into web crypto and you don't really want to do it on a low level and do it yourself, basically, then have a look at this library. It's uh, basically will provide you quite a nice uh, abstraction for it. All right, next thing we got is this node kitten. Uh, you might be wondering what the hell is this? Well, it's actually a Twitter bot that will uh, tweet out all the Node.js releases. So if you are wanting to be up to date with the Node.js releases, you can just follow this Twitter bot and it will tweet whatever the releases are there. I mean, there's not that many of them, so it's not gonna be too noisy, but I think it's really cool if you wanna be up to date and it has a cat, like, come on, it's, it's a kitten, what do you want? Right, continuing, we got an illusion clock demo. Uh, this kind of blows my mind, and literally, because you know, it kind of, those illusions always hurt my brain a bit. <laughs> but it's really cool. So this is um, actually, so you can actually reveal it. And you know, you probably should see it, but uh, you can even have it with seconds here. If you focus for a few seconds, you should be able to see the illusion here. It does hurt a bit. But um, the cool thing is that basically there is a source code. So if you want to see how it's done, it's it's done in a canvas. So if you inspect it, you will see the, hey, come on, what's, where, where did it go? Wait, what, what happened? Where's my, no, I want the result. Why did you hide it? There you go. It's a canvas based app. So it's a pretty cool, mm -hmm. oh, words are hard. It's a pretty cool case study. There you go. All right, continuing, we got Art of Node, a short introduction to Node.js. Well, I wouldn't call it short because, I mean, look at the size of the thing. But if you wanted to get into Node.js and you are still didn't know some things about it or maybe want a comprehensive introduction to all of its parts, including callbacks, promises, and all that kind of stuff, then this repo is a really, really good start. It's also is very freely licensed, CC BY, which is great. So, you know, if you wanted to get into Node.js, do have a look, this is a pretty good starting point. All right, next thing we got is CCLI, a colorful cat command built in Node.js, which, you know, looks pretty nice. So it's uh, basically color cats. Um, I don't know if, why would you take it over something like CCAT, um, Linux, there you go. Uh, I believe the CCAT is built in Golang, which makes it, way smaller and way faster than Node.js, but you know, maybe if you don't wanna pull this one, I don't know, for whatever reason, then you can use the Node.js alternative, but hey, what, what do I know? All right, continuing, we got Taskbot.js, a JavaScript, TypeScript, job processing framework. Uh, they claim it to be best on the planet. We're not gonna, we're not gonna say that. It's just a job processing framework that is based on Redis queue, right, in the background, but, um, Seems to have a pretty simple API. So if you are looking for a job processing, uh, come on, where's the quick start guide? They don't have a quick start guide, what the hell? If you are looking for, um, no, that's not what I wanted. If you're looking for a decently simple framework to do that, then, you know, have a look. This seems to be quite straightforward one. Um, again, you would need a Redis in the background to work with it, but then again, that means it's not quite as simple as you might want. But yeah, uh, it does require a commercial version. So if you are looking for something that is completely free, that is not what you should look at, but uh, still pretty cool to see it. And you know, then again, the license uh, seems to be, yeah, GBL3. So there you go. 
Right, continuing, we got React Bulma components. You might be wondering why am I highlighting the Bulma based React framework? Well, because this one is actually not just uh, taking the Bulma CSS and including it into the components, but actually using the underlying styles like column SAS, for example, right? Importing just the styles and um, including them into a component. So when you install it and when you import it you will actually get just those tiny slices of uh columns right so you can also import the full thing if you want to but then again if you don't you can import these specific parts right uh which is pretty cool all right continuing we got react i like sometimes those names i'm react react plier 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 Let's call it React Player. <laughs> it's a React video player, basically, and it looks really nice. And it's really easy to use because you literally just say, hey, here's my player. He's the, it even supports the YouTube video IDs if you want to, but uh, you can also pass into your own videos if you want. Uh, seems to be quite easy to use and has a pretty nice UI. So, you know, if you wanted uh, something like this, do have a look at this, purely HTML5, I believe. Um, includes the CSS, so yeah. Right, continuing we got React GitHub Corner. Um, if you wanted to have a GitHub Corner thing, this one, and you needed it it's as a React component, pretty configurable one, by the way. So you can like choose where, it, uh, you know, where it is positioned. You can choose the link, you can choose the size, which is, I think, really cool. And uh, you can choose ARIA label, color, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so this is pretty neat. And again, React, TypeScript, all that kind of stuff. All right, continuing, we got ViewWait, the uh, thing that we just talked about in the articles, right? So if you wanted very elaborate uh, waiting component in View that basically provides you abstractions for waiting for just about anything, then this is your pick. So yeah, pretty neat one, do check it out. Continuing, we got VS Code Lit HTML. Um, really like the name, the pun here, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's basically adds syntax highlighting for HTML inside the JavaScript and TypeScript tag templates. So template literals, right? Uh, this was one of my um, sort of annoyances is that when you write sort of templates in a very basic way in template literals, it is, you don't get the highlighting, right? So this extension essentially fixes it, really straightforward and uh, quite useful, I would say, yeah. Right, next thing we got is DynaLoop REST API library built on top of Express.js powered with TypeScript. So if you essentially, if you wanted to do REST APIs in TypeScript, uh, it also seems to be very object oriented uh, style because you use classes and decorators for everything. Then do have a look at this. So I believe the Express by this time already has a pretty decent TypeScript definitions, but you know, this probably is way more object oriented and uh, maybe some people prefer that way better. So I personally like the functional programming more, but hey, that's just my thing. Right, next thing we got is called Reads or Rete, I'm not sure. Uh, it's a JavaScript framework for visual programming and creating node editor. So it allows you to do things like this, which is really, really cool. So there's some bunch of examples, like for example, flow based programming like this one. So you can actually, you know, drag all this stuff around and connect, disconnect things. And uh, this is actually really, really cool. Um, I had to build a bunch of those myself. And let me tell you, you don't want to do this yourself. So the fact that there is a framework like this is actually absolutely amazing. I'm going to use it in the next time I need to build something like this myself. <laughs> this is just awesome. So like, if you ever need to build something like this, and you know, if you're working with a any way of UIs, you're gonna have to build it at some point. Look at this, this just looks great. All right, next thing we got is microstates.js, composable state primitives for JavaScript. Um, yeah, it's exactly like microstates, what you would expect from it. Uh, the guess the core thing is that they are composable and you can actually combine them, which is pretty cool. Um, not sure I would use that, I mean, there is, I still, at least for you know the apps that I've built, I always found that the global one global mega state, I guess, is the best approach. Uh, I tried building an apps with a smaller states, but it always end up in a mess. But uh, 
I don't know, there probably are cases for this, right? I just don't know about them. So if you need them, then have a look. That looks pretty interesting. Right, the last thing we have in libraries is called AXAX, or I guess maybe XX, I'm not sure. Again, naming. Uh, it's an async iterator extensions for JavaScript. So basically async map, reduce, filter, flat map, and so on and so forth. Uh, once again, I'm not sure how this compares to the uh, RxJS or IxJS, which is, I guess, more or less the same, but, you know, do we have a look at this one? Maybe this is, maybe you like it more than RxJS, although I'm not sure why, because RxJS is pretty great. Right, and the last thing I got for you guys is a bit of a silly thing, and it's called JavaScript is getting real tired of your jokes. I won't spoil the thing, so just go ahead and watch it yourself. It is quite funny. I'm like, it's it's just great. <laughs> like it's the, um, what was it? How was the, I, like, I don't know. I honestly don't know the in English name of the movie. I know it's the movie called in Russian, but hell if I know it's properly called in English because they never properly translate the, the, the English names of movies into Russian. And they always mess it up. But it's basically a really cool movie with Jim Carrey where he is forced to tell the truth. Was it like lie, lie, lie or something? I don't remember. But uh, it's a really cool high quality video on, uh, yes, every pics on, you know, every language has its problems, basically. <laughs> Let's just put it this way. Uh, really, I'm using and highly recommend it to watch. All right. Um, that's actually it from my side. So that's all I have for today. Liar, liar. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much. Um, I think they messed up the translation in Russian once again, but whatever. So if you guys have anything else that you think I might have missed this week, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in chat right now. As usual, you can find everything that we talked about right here on GitHub under buildingxtrusjs slash bxjsweekly um, under episodes. This is episode 18, as I already said. All that stuff is there, all the links and everything. Um, as usual, we'll be more than happy to cover your personal project, your libraries and your articles. Would always love to see what you guys are up to. Uh, if you think I missed something, do feel free to send it over my way as well. You can send it to me on Twitter, here on GitHub, on our Discord server or on Twitch. I'm open to all of these methods of communication. Not related to news, but do you need a boilerplate for Next or rather would you... For ne boilerplate for Next.js? Really? Like... I thought the whole point of Next.js is that you don't really need any boilerplates. Let me just turn on the light real quick. It's getting slightly dark here. Um, I mean, I think the whole point of Next.js is that you don't actually need a boilerplate for it. I guess um, maybe you would. it would be uh, sort of need to have starting projects for more complex setups, because it is a bit of a pain to configure it, for example, to use with TypeScript and less and CSS and, you know, stuff like this. It's not extremely hard, it's just a bit annoying. So maybe something like next create app that does this for you. I don't think the boilerplate itself would be very helpful. So because, I mean, you literally don't need any boilerplate. You just do like install next, install react, install react DOM, and create pages index HTML, you're done, index.js, and you're done, right? So it's, it's really simple. So yeah, um, I mean, just, just, just look at this stuff. You just go to next.js and you look at the first setup and it's like it fits into one page. That, that's all you need to do. This is like, why would you need a boilerplate for that, right? So, yeah. All right, do you guys have any other questions, articles that I missed, suggestions, or whatever you want to discuss? I am still open for things. Uh, if not, then, I mean, we can just uh, wrap it up here for today and you can continue watching football. I think it should still be on, maybe. I don't, I don't know, don't ask me, I'm not a football guy. Um, right. Okay, doesn't seem to be the case. No more questions, no more articles. Thank you very much. Well, pff, God, I, how can I mess up <laughs> saying thank you? Okay, you, you can see. I'm just bad at this. All right, but there we go. Uh, thank you for watching, as always. Thank you for staying with me. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to ask questions in the comments. You are always more than welcome to come to our Discord server to ask your questions there. There's a lot of people who will help you, including me, obviously. Uh, as usual, send your stuff over my way. We'd be more than happy to look at it and talk about it. Uh, yeah, thank you for watching. Have an awesome weekend and I see you next 
Wednesday, I guess, for um, another programming live stream. Yes. See you next Wednesday. And yeah, as I said, have an awesome weekend and uh, bye.